Hello and welcome back to my channel. This is the second of two vlogs I'm shooting today. I didn't expect to have an opportunity to do any filming today, but I did. That's a long, unfortunate um, story behind it. So anyway, today for my Spooktober look, I'm wearing some brand new dark blue glitter eyeshadow called Constellation from NYX. And I'm, I'm wearing some mascara for the first time in um, many, many years. And I'm also wearing my favorite um, purple lipstick from NYX as well. I don't have any makeup brushes, so that's why it looks kind of really thick and like I look kind of I know I look like a vampire my mother thinks I always look like a vampire when my when I wear my fun colored makeups but you know it's a fun look for Spooktober and that's kind of the look you're going for anyway so today I'm going to be doing a Dantean post one of the uh, I wrote this um post and my uh, main blog back in August called why you should read the divine comedy in Italian obviously the you means um non-Italians but just like you can anyone can like Look at these um, points about for any work in any language and kind of tweak them to that particular work or author because there's nothing quite like reading or at least listening to if you don't understand the language a work in the language it was actually written in and for so many um, beautiful reasons. So let's get on with it. Well, I doubt many people learn another language simply to read one book. And if you do, that seems kind of like ridiculous and pedantic and like, why are you wasting your time with just that? There really is no experience quite like reading a work in its original language. And if you're a Dantista, which means like a, a Dante scholar or a Dante expert, be you autodidactic like I am, or professionally trained with a PhD, odds are good you'll want to read the Commedia in Italian. Who cares if it's not widely seen as a useful language like Spanish, French, German, Arabic, or Chinese? You should learn a language because you genuinely want to. Other people's opinions be damned. And in hindsight, I really feel like I should have, you know, stood up for myself a little bit more when my parents made me take Spanish starting in junior high because I really wanted to take French. And French probably would have been a lot more personally useful to me because of, you know, you can do more um, studying, like, first-person um, sources and, like, a lot of historical documents and journals and French when you're doing, like, graduate work and even undergraduate work and lots of the other, like, historical sources I read while writing, reading my, researching my um, historical fiction are also in French and the old books I've, many of old books I read have untranslated French passages because everyone spoke French as a second language. Um, I don't think Spanish would have been um, as personally useful to me as French was, although I do think um, the Spanish um, language literature is a lot more interesting to me and also more interested in, it's like Spanish and Latin American history as well and culture more than like the French equivalents. But you know, that's a, so I'm sorry, I'm rambling. This is like a long um, story for another topic. It's just sort of related to the point of, you know, learn a language because both because it's useful to you and because you want to, not because other people are like forcing you to or think that's the one you need to take. But however, one need not become fluent in Italian prior to reading or rereading the book. Take formal classes or do self-study. All one needs to do is get an addition with side-by-side -side Italian and English. Maybe you want to read each canto in English first, then Italian, or vice versa. Or do a tercet by tercet. Maybe even be bold and read the entire book in Italian first, or just listen to someone reading it in Italian. And this is one of the many reasons why I purchased the Derling Martinez translation. It has a dual side-by-side -side English and Italian. This is um, what we'll be up to tomorrow in the 100 Days of Dante, um, canto number 22 of Inferno. And this is what also what I wrote down in my little notebook when I was memorizing canto 1 of Inferno. And I'm, I could, kind of took a little bit of a break from memorizing canto 2 of Inferno. I'm up to 45 lines, but it's like basically after you climb a giant mountain, you don't immediately begin climbing another mountain. You need to take like a little break, like a breather, some downtime, relax, and then you can like start working on the other one because, you know, when it's genuinely not coming or you just feel like mentally and emotionally exhausted from a long like memorization journey, don't just immediately jump in and like start doing the other one right away. You need to like take a little bit of a breather and like just do all like, like things I've been mentioning about you know, just take a break and don't immediately start doing it again. I'm sorry, I'm rambling. And this is what personally meaningful immersion is all about, something many foreign language teachers don't understand. It's easier to learn a language if one truly enjoys it instead of treating it like an obligatory academic requirement, which unfortunately many schools, at least in the U.S., do. While I studied Italian my senior year of high school, and studied the very similar Spanish for seven years, starting to read and memorize the Commedia in its original language has already begun working wonders on my language skills. I recognize verb forms and cognates, and can match Italian words with their English translation. The more you immerse yourself in a language, the more you begin to naturally understand. After a certain point, you'll rely less and less on the English side or look in words up. 
And then one day you find yourself speaking, reading, and or writing in that language as though you were always fluent. And I wish more foreign language teachers would take this approach instead of making people mindlessly memorize long, you know, declension and like verb conjugation tables and like vocabulary words. That's not like what's going to help you like if you're like possibly doing like research for that in like graduate school or like moving to a country or doing business with people from that country in your um, future job or just you know traveling to that country someday you want to learn to speak the language so you can talk to the natives well or maybe you're more interested in literature for example so that teachers could give you some books to read or some like stories or poetry you could watch some films in that language or maybe for like you know hair and makeup and clothes like go to some youtubers who speak that language and watch them and that's just how it will naturally come to you because it's meaningful not because you just were forced them one size fits all memorization just so you could you know pass the test and um read you know like Virgil or you know Victor Hugo or whoever for the AP test or like in your senior year of high school even the best translations will never be 100% accurate to the Italian original Example, Dante uses a lot of R sounds to evoke the feeling of dried, twisted tree branches and the wood of the suicides. And he uses many L sounds to evoke the running water near Gerion. I, I know um, a lot of Italian speakers pronounce the name of this um, monster Gerion, but since it's like originally a Greek name, I pronounce it Gerion or Gerion. I know Gerion sounds more like uh, the Hebrew name, but it might, it's probably is like Gerion, not Gerion. Anyway. It's impossible to translate that into English without taking multiple linguistic liberties. Another example is Canto 12 of Purgatorio, where four tercets in a row start with the word Videa, I saw. The next four start with the poetic one-letter word O, no translation needed. And the next four start with Mostrava, showed, depicted, displayed. In many manuscripts, until about the late 18th century, the letters U and V were printed or written interchangeably, which is sort of like how the letter S is often, or the lowercase letter S is often like written as like a big letter F in printed um, books. It's just like one of the little um, linguistic quirks that was like around for a while. Thus, Dante is spelling out the word uom, man, in the old-fashioned generic sense to refer to all humans. Some translators have ambitiously risen to the challenge and spelt out man in English with phrasing like, my eyes beheld, ah, and now is shown, which is in the Hollander's translation, which I've read, I'm um, dipped in and out of through the um, Princeton Dante project where you can access for free online. And again, that requires linguistic liberties. All translations of any book or poem do this to some degree, but it just looks and feels more impressive in the original, more impressive and emotional in the original. And obviously, I, as I've said, I don't really have a problem with, you know, gently creative liberties in a translation so long as it, you know, enhances the, like, the emotional or beautiful, like, image that's being created or to, like, fit in, like, like blank verse and iambic pentameter or a certain rhyme scheme, but, you know, that isn't always quite literary, literally accurate, and so you have to, you know, strike a balance and decide what's more important to you, literal meaning and, like, knowing it to help you with learning another language or just feel like this is the most accurate as possible and that's um, what I want to know and like get out of reading this book or I just want the experience of reading a beautiful poem and I care more about you know beautiful imagery and emotional evocations than you know being like as true to the letter as possible so that's just something you have to weigh when you're thinking about which translation you'd like and which translations don't work for you. Now when you have a side-by-side -side edition it's easier to discern when and where the translator took liberties even if you're not fluent in Italian. It'll be obvious when entire big sections of lines are invented, when things are put in the wrong order, and when words are translated inaccurately. For example, on some translators translate the line, and like one with labored breath, e come quei che con lena affinata, as like a swimmer with labored breath, or simply, and like a swimmer in Canto 1 of Inferno. And when I was doing my recitation video of this last month, I was considering like breathing heavily and panting myself like around the time I recited that line, but I decided against it. I didn't know if it would like have the write impression or it would like come across weird. I understand the reason for this, given the following lines where Dante compares himself to being released from the perilous waters of the deep to the shore. But again, it's not helpful if you're serious about learning Italian and having an as accurate of a translation as possible. And again, I don't really have a problem with this, you know, in moderation as long as it seems, you know, done respectfully and I understand the translator's reasoning behind it, even if I might not 
personally like the effect, but you know, at least it's not quite accurate if what you're going for is trying to, you know, have an accurate as picture as possible and like line up the English with the Italian for, you know, just you want that kind of experience out of your reading instead of poetic stuff. Since starting my memorization journey in March, I feel much closer to Dante. He's always been the only one of my favorite writers who's always felt like a dear personal friend instead of just someone I deeply admire and or would love to spend a few days talking with. But reading and learning his words in his native tongue made our super rational connection even stronger. When you read a book, story, poem, or play untranslated, or if you like watch uh, the silent film with um, intertitles, you're reading it or watching it exactly as the author wrote it, not someone else's presentation of it in another language. So many words and phrases can't be fully expressed in translation, and it just feels more emotional, evocative, expressive, beautiful, haunting, intense. Something is always lost in translation. While you can understand many things and learn a lot from Italian, a lot of Italian from reading the original, it's still in medieval Florentine Tuscan, not modern standard Italian. Granted, modern Italian is strongly based upon Florentine Tuscan due to how many literary lights used it, but they're not one and the same. Open a new document, set the language to Italian, and type out a canto, which I did with canto one during my memorization journey. You'll see which words are flagged as misspellings and autocorrected, and which words pass recognition. Most of the differences aren't that great, and if you already know Italian, you can figure out what a lot of the unfamiliar words mean based on context and similar spelling. So I'm, I'm not an Italian speaker myself, and I unfortunately only had one formal year of Italian learning. I've learned a bit on and off over the years. I would really like to get back to learning the language to fluency, but you know there will be um, you know some differences between the old and the new versions of Italian. Just there, there are some in English or but many other languages too. Like you can't guess even if you're fluent in that language necessarily, or just as like a completely different meaning or connotation in the modern era. But obviously, many Italian speakers can talk about this um better than I can. I'm you know, a native Italian, a native English speaker. Sorry, and it's just not a language I'm like fluent in. Like I'm knew like you know Spanish for seven years and I would I knew a lot about that language but you know not to the degree I know English even then it's just something that you it comes to you naturally when it's your native language you like these things or you don't see them based on you know context and intent basically it's equivalent to reading the Canterbury Tales in Middle English with far fewer spelling differences and I have you know, looked at certain parts of the Canterbury Tales in the original instead of translated and I a lot of the Spellings look really weird and hard to figure out, but I'm told when you like hear it being read or like listening to an audiobook, it makes a lot more sense. Like, oh, that's what that word is. It makes sense when it's pronounced, but it looks like really weird and unintuitive when I'm just looking at it written out. And obviously, it's a lot more um, intelligible and easy to understand than the like the old versions of Italian or English. Like I've written read um some of um. Beowulf and the Lord's Prayer and like Old English and like you can barely understand a word. There are like a few like here and there that are the same or very similar. You can like make a really educated guess, but otherwise it's like reading like Klingon for that matter. Learning another language gives us a passport to another world. Who better to learn Italian with than the supreme poet? Oh, thank you for um listening to this um vlog. I'm sorry if I rambled a little bit. I did base it off of a blog posts which I wrote but I would like you know freestyled a few of the points which I didn't get into so much in the blog and I know that kind of leads to rambling a little bit I need to learn to you know edit myself as I'm speaking just as I've learned how to edit myself when I'm writing on blog posts and fiction so um thank you very much for tuning in and watching to the end my next blog vlog will hopefully um, be tomorrow I haven't decided about what yet? So thank you for tuning in and please consider subscribing if you haven't already. I plan to do some more Dantean posts and some other book reviews and I'm still I'm working to do the um, author tube newbie tag in future. So please um, tune in for my next vlog. Thank you very much for watching. See you then. Bye.